us. It's, 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 it's good for our, our souls. You know, as we nourish our bodies, could you imagine if we just said, you know, it's cold and dark outside, I'm not going to eat anything today. Um, that's why we eat, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we nourish our souls. We nourish uh, our spirits with the Word of God. And, and, and these times together, the time in fellowship with brothers and sisters, getting together, having a time to come and to check in on each other, say hello and extend a greeting and how are you doing? And this is, this is what it's about. That's why we have a family like this. And uh, don't neglect it. Allow, allow the Lord to use one another to enrich each other's lives for his sake. And, you know, the church at Corinth, that was kind of uh, one, of their, one of their issues. Remember from the very beginning of the letter, Paul was addressing the, the quibbling, the fighting, the divisions. And uh, he said, you know, nobody's of anybody. We're all of Christ. And uh, when, when you come together, he talked about the meetings, the gatherings. When you come together, it's all about Christ. Don't make it about your issues or somebody else's issues. Uh, make it about Jesus. Don't make it about your differences. Make it about your common bond in Jesus. And uh, then he continues going through some other questions that they had. He talks about what love looks like, what true love looks like, and and how refreshing it is to read what Jesus says love is and how Jesus modeled love versus what our world says love is. And, um, you know, even though the, the, the social norms and the culture can, you know, rise and fall and ebb and flow, we have an anchor in the Word of God that does not change, that does not move, and we have a God of all who is love and changes not, and we have that we can hold to. We don't lose our way if we believe this book. If we hold to what the Bible says, we don't lose our way. We don't get tossed. We don't get scared. Uh, we may be, um, you know, like the New Testament says, maybe persecute and suffer and, and um, be down and discouraged, but we, we, we have the eternal facts of the Word of God to hold on to and hold on to them. Uh, don't let our, our world sway what God has clearly said. And so Paul then comes to the 15th chapter of this letter, this long letter that he wrote to them. And if you've, if you've not read 2 Corinthians in a while, let me, let me encourage you to do so. So when you get a chance in the next coming days or weeks, maybe you'll have some downtime during uh, Christmas time, and go to 2 Corinthians and just listen to how Paul writes to them following what he said in this first letter. And you'll see a nurturing side to him where he says, uh, I'm, after this, I'm not going to write anymore because I want to come to you face to face. I want you to see my face, that I'm not mad and that I do love you and that I am for you. And uh, so I want you to read that when you get a chance following this because you'll see uh, the apostle's heart for the people. Uh, but he gets to the 15th chapter and he's talking about the resurrection because some of them were saying there is no resurrection. We just don't understand how that could even be possible. And so he gives them the gospel. He says, let me just re remind you, let me go over again what I told you from the very beginning. The gospel. And folks, if you are saved, you believed in the resurrection. And you can't, you can't divorce that from the good news. It is the good news. And uh, so he says, look, it, it all starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus died, buried, and was and risen. And then he gives the proofs, then he goes through, he has witness stand type mentality, and then he goes through the logical expressions of the resurrection. And then he gets into some of the, uh, what we might call mysterious or new revelation regarding the, re the resurrection, the facts. And then what we're going to see tonight is uh, some encouragement about how, what kind of body will we have? I, uh, all week I was thinking about the Southern Gospel song, I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life, you know, and, and uh, I know we're all ready for a new body, you know, and, and uh, we can use some, uh, a new body with zero miles on it instead of all the mileage we have on the one. 
that we have. But what is that going to look like? You know, we, people ask all the time, when I get to heaven, will I know my loved ones? Will, will they look the same? Will they look different? How will I know? And what will it be like? And, and Paul kind of gives us a little bit here by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ as to how that's going to work a little bit. Um, it's not all of ours to know. We have what God wants us to know. But let's dive in and see how it's going to kind of work, what kind of a body we're going to have, and the fact that what we do with the body we currently have is important. And uh, we're to use it while we're here to remain continuous in our work for the Lord. So let's look at this passage here. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50 through the end. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal ha shall have put on immoral immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. In the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray tonight. Now, Heavenly Father, as we approach your holy word, and Lord, these, these great uh, truths about our future, I ask that you would encourage our hearts tonight with this news. That you would give us insight and Help us to understand a little bit better about our future. And Lord, more importantly, that while we still have this flesh, this body, this vessel, that we will use it for your glory. That we'll do exactly what we've been commissioned to do here in verse 58. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so he starts off with talking about how is this going to work? How is it going to work that we're going to die, these old decayed bodies that some are, are literally dust at this point? How is it going to work that that's going to have a body and a form and a shape and we're going to be alive again? So he says, now this I say, verse 50, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So our physical bodies, this kind of body, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus when he met him that evening. He said, uh, you must be born again. In order to see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You cannot see it except you be born again. And so you have to be born again because this body, this type of body, cannot inherit incorruption. Why? Because this body is corruptible. So there has to be a different type of body. Now Jesus, after his resurrection, if you recall in the, in the Gospels, he said, go ahead and handle me, didn't he? Remember, he ate with them. He consumed food and, and he was a physical form. He said, go ahead, put your hand in my wounds. Put your fingers in my wounds and your hand in my side. He had a physical body that you could touch and feel. But it's interesting that Jesus never said it was flesh and blood. Jesus said it was flesh and bones. I don't know what there is to that. I'm not smart enough to know all that. 
And God has kind of veiled some of those things. But it is going to be different than this body, yet similar enough that we'll know it's a body. When the disciples saw him, he wasn't just an orb floating around. They saw him as a physical body. He had a voice, didn't he? Remember when they were out in the boat and Jesus was on the shore making fish and they were, he said, hey, children, have you caught any fish? He said, no, we haven't caught anything. Under their breath, breath probably saying, who's the wise guy on the shore making fun of us because we haven't caught any fish? He says, go ahead and cast your net on the other side. And who knows what else they might have said there. Um, and then John, John said, wait a minute. I know that voice. He recognized his voice. So there will be some similarities. The body type will be different, but it will be recognizable. And, and the rest of that, I can't dogmat dogmatically speak about, but there, there's what we have. We have the truth that God wants us to have. It'll be a body. It'll be recognizable by, by features and by, even by voice. Jesus was. And so it's not flesh and blood. It's flesh and bones. And there will be a change because this kind of body cannot inherit incorruption. Now, verse 51, he says, Behold, watch this. See, look, I shew you a mystery. Ooh. When they read this letter publicly at, at Corinth, and, and whoever read this letter said that part, I wonder if everybody leaned forward. Shh, there's a mystery. Everybody loves a mystery, right? You like to have new stuff revealed. You want to know something that you haven't known before. And you want to dig in and find out what the deal So he says, now I'm going to show you a mystery. Something you haven't known to this point. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And every nursery in America has that, <laughs> that Bible verse somewhere posted in it, right? Um, but he says, we're not all going to sleep. Not all of us are going to sleep. Sleep because remember how we view death as done. God views the death of this body as sleep. Because we are not finished yet. We, we still have a soul that's ongoing. And so he says, not everybody's going to sleep. Not everybody is going to die. Some will be alive at the rapture. And, and 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that, some, or I think it's 4. 13 through uh, the end of the chapter there, tells us that some will be alive. Those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So not everybody's going to sleep. Not everybody's going to be uh, dead when the Lord Jesus comes. But, contrast, we shall all be changed. So somewhere between here and there, our bodies are going to change. I don't know how, but God does. And I'll leave those details up to him. But somewhere between here and there, we're all going to be changed. Those who are asleep and those who are awake, we're all going to be changed between here and there. Every believer throughout all of mankind will be changed in that moment. Resurrection from, for some, those who are asleep in Christ, and rapture for some, those who are alive or awake in Christ. Now this is one change we can all look forward to, right? Um, old, decaying, decrepit body changing into a new one. That will not corrupt. That will not decay. That will not erode. It's an incorruptible, immortal body. Looking forward to that change, aren't you? There are a lot of changes that uh, through my 42 years on this earth that I looked forward to. When I was a young man, I looked forward to getting taller. Still looking forward to getting taller. I looked forward to being stronger, you know, and then you get older and maybe taller and stronger, and then there's changes that start happening that you don't look forward to. You're losing hair here, and it's growing here and here and here. It's the mysterious things of life. We don't look forward to those changes. But I'll tell you one change we're all looking forward to is that this 
in this corruptible will put on incorruptible. And this mortal will put on immortality. I'm looking forward to that. And we'll all be changed. Verse 52 tells us how long that's going to take. That's, that sounds like that would take a while, right? That would be quite a transformation. But 52 says in a moment. Not just a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, in a moment, a split second, faster than you can blink. The, the eyes gleam faster than that. The last trumpet will sound, and the dead, the corruptible, will be raised incorruptible. We will be changed just that fast. And that's, that's wonderful. And a literal overnight change. We hear all the time, things don't change overnight. This time, it'll be faster than overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day, but our bodies will change in the twinkling of an eye. Power of God, right? It's taking something that is decaying and dead to something that is incorruptible. Thriving, alive, growing. Uh, and it's just going to be that fast. We're going to be raised incorruptible. That trumpet shall sound. And as you know, in, in this culture, the... The trumpets had a lot of reasons for sounding, and usually there was something happening at a trumpet blast, and we won't go through all those things, but the significance of the trumpet sounding is something is changing, something is happening. And so when that trumpet blasts, faster than we can think, faster than we can blink, we'll be changed into incorruptible. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And you say that's redundant, except for the words must. It's not a thing that might happen. It must happen. God has willed it. God has ordained it. It must happen. Thankful that that's a must in the Bible. This body must change. Corrosive, decomposition, decaying, feeble, brittle, dare I say, sagging, balding, shrinking, will change in just a split second into a live, developing, growing, and healthy. Mere humanity, just dust and water, will change into immortality, eternal, everlasting, and imperishable that quickly. 54 tells us there's a change of place in 54 through 57 it says for when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written so he says look this has been talked about for a long time Paul says it's a mystery because I'm giving you a few details but really the prophets have been talking about this for a long time and the first thing he says in 54 is death is swallowed, swallowed up in victory. Where is that? Isaiah 25. Keep your finger there and go to Isaiah 25. Let's see where it was talked about long before this. Isaiah 25. It is written. It must take place. God called this a long time ago. Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8 says, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all the faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And you know when he says it, you can mark it down. Take it to the bank, it's an absolute. It's going to happen. The Lord hath spoken it, that death will be swallowed up in victory. It was said before, it's said again, death will no longer has any effect on our new body. Isn't that good? No more separation. No more watching a loved one suffer. It'll have no more effect. Death is absolutely powerless on the new body. 55. O oh death, where is your sting? That was from Hosea 13. Turn there with me. Keep your finger there and... 1 Corinthians, go to Hosea 13. Hosea, that's Old Testament. Um, if you have a tabbed Bible like me, you're blessed. Hosea 13. 
and verse 14. Hosea 13, 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. So God throws some pretty tough talk to death in the grave there. And Paul's echoing that hundreds of years later. He's echoing it in verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Like a venomous snake without fangs. The potential to be harmless, harmful, but absolutely harmless. Death will be tortured and plagued. God is bringing widespread affliction and catastrophe to death. I mean, isn't that what death has done to us? Death for, well, since mankind has been on the face of the earth, death has brought widespread affliction and catastrophe to us. And God says there's coming a day when I'm going to turn the tables and you will be unable to touch my people because I'm going to unleash widespread affliction and catastrophe upon death. The grave has been destroyed by the one who is life. The graves are empty. Death has no power. So we go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and we read, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? And then Paul says, now watch now for a minute, the sting of death is sin. What is the sting of death? It's sin. It's that split second zap that causes death. Split second, isn't it? A sting. A sting may or may not be super painful. Just a split second is all it takes, though. Just a sting can cause immeasurable amounts of pain and suffering and even death, can't it? Just a sting. But the sting of death is sin. This demonstrates that it is not any amount of sinning that matters because all have sinned. No amount of good works on earth, on our part, can reverse that sting. The wages of sin, period, is death. One sting is all it takes. And we're infected with death. This body that you and I live in, because every one of us has sinned, we've all been zapped with that split second sting, and that sting has put us into sure death. The strength of sin. Where does sin get its traction? Well, it's the law. Sin is made known, and it gets its traction by the law. Now think about it like this. If you're having a hard time putting these two together, think of it like this. The law is like the sight of a bite or a sting. Suppose you get bitten by a venomous snake. And you look at that, that bite, there's probably a, a mark or at least, maybe even a, a little hole there. Some blood's drawn. And after time, you're, what's going to begin to happen is you're going to have redness and swelling And then slowly you're going to start to feel the effects of that split-second sting or bite. And it it swells and it becomes painful. And you know what that bite does, that sting does? It lets us know that something is wrong. Something is happening and something is not good. And if it's not remedied, it'll bring death. The law does not remedy the sting, does it? The, the, the bite mark doesn't fix the death. You might be able to cover that up with a Band-Aid. You might be able to sew up where the sting was. You might be able to remove the stinger or get the poison out of that little spot. But you know what the, the, the mark does, the bite mark does? It can't fix you. It can't stop what's going on now inside of you. It's just there to show you Something happened right there. 
And what happened right there is causing my body now to be in pain and, and eventually die. If I don't do something about it, it's just, a, it's just a reminder that something's happened. It's a point that you can point to and say, that's where I was bitten. That's all it is. You can't take that mark and fix you. It shows you that something happened. It's just like sin, right? Or just like the law. The law says something happened. The law tells us you have sinned. You've fallen short of the glory of God. You can't measure up to God's law. You can't be perfect. Something's wrong. Something happened. But that, that mark can't stop the effects of that poison. We, we think it can. Well, if I just put a Band-Aid over that, I'll be fine. We, we know that's silly, right? We understand that that's foolishness. You can't put a Band-Aid over a, a, a snake bite and it'd be okay. But that's what we try to do. It'll be okay if I just cover that up, just take care of that part, it'll be fine. Now, there's something way deep. The wages of sin is death. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The law does not remedy the sting. It merely points out that something terrible has happened and must be stopped. Well, how can it be stopped? The next verse, 57. But thanks be to God. There is a way to stop the destruction. There is a way to eradicate sin. There is a way to take care of not only the little bite mark, but there is a way to take care of the effects happening inside of you. There's one antidote. There's one way to stop your body from dying and stop your soul, as it were, from dying. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. How did he eradicate the sin? What is the antidote? God did it. Thank you, God, for stopping it. Thank you, God, for putting an end to sin's reign and rule over my body. Thank you, God, for sin having no effect on me from now on. My sins are forgiven. They're moved as far as the east is from the west. They're cast into the depths of the sea. They're behind his back. Our record looks like Jesus. How did that happen? What is the antidote? End of verse 57. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've all been stung. We've all been bitten. And the law says, whoa, look at that. Something bad happened. Boy, that's where it took place, and it's starting to swell and get ugly. Maybe just put a Band-Aid over me, and everything will be fine. Jesus, God says that's not how this works. You've got to have it taken care of on the inside. There has to be something to, to battle the sin. And what battled the sin was the Lord Jesus Christ when he became our sin. And he took the wrath of God upon himself. So that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Remember in, in, in the, is, the Israelite camp when God sent the fiery serpents among the people. And remember when they were bitten, what do we do? And God told Moses, what you want to do is take a, take a piece of brass and carve it into a snake and put it up on a, on a cross beam and tell people, when you're bitten, just look at that and you will live. There's one antidote to that snake bite, and it's looking by faith on that. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Look and live. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, he is the antidote of sin. Wow, what a thought, right? And this corruptible, by the grace and power of God, is going to put on incorruptible through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin, death, no more effect. No more power over us. And then we come to verse 58, and we get an admonition here. Therefore, therefore means because of all of this, because of everything I've just said, whoa, right? Take it all in, and because of that, 
because of Jesus and what he's done, because he has saved your soul from death and sin and hell and the grave, because Jesus Christ is the antidote, you have received the antidote, you have everlasting life. Because of that, brothers, be ye steadfast, meaning established. Be established in what? Well, be unmovable, don't change. Don't change from what? What has been taught, what has been told, what has been given. Don't, don't remove yourself from what I gave you. I gave you the gospel. Don't walk away from it, he says. Be steadfast. Be unmovable, unchanging. And then look what he says. Not just abounding, always abounding. Never stop moving forward. Always abounding. Never stop moving forward. Don't sit still. Don't go backwards. Don't wonder, well, what if the gospel isn't true? What if the resurrection may not be? What if Jesus really didn't die? What if this is all a sham and it's a cult and we're just believing a lie? What if he says, stop that. Stay true to what you know. Keep moving. Always keep moving forward in what you know. And always keep moving forward in the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord? Boy, a lot of people have really misused that phrase, haven't they? They've abused it and lied about it and changed it. What is the work of the Lord? Is this the Lord? What is the Lord's work? Well, it's Christian service, loving God, loving each other. It's the work of the Lord. Sharing the gospel, it's the work of the Lord. Using our gifts to benefit and encourage brothers and sisters, that's the work. By the way, the word work is there for a reason. It didn't say in the attitude of the Lord. It said work. And he goes on later to say labor. We are supposed to serve. Serving is not bad. And he says in the work of the Lord. Loving God, loving each other, sharing the gospel, using our gifts to benefit and encourage brothers and sisters, giving cheerfully and generously of our time, our talent. Because we needed another T word, treasure. That's the work of the Lord. Why? Why should I, why should I <laughs> remain steady and unmovable and always moving forward? Why? Is it worth it? Why? Well, because he says, for as much. And that means because you know. As you know. You should know this, he says, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your service to the Lord and for the Lord is not useless. Christian service, working for the Lord, is profitable whether we see results or not. It's profitable. God has given us that promise. It's not in vain in the Lord. Listen, you cannot lose when you serve the Lord. You can't lose. It may look like you're losing. It may look like you're not moving forward. It may seem like nothing's happening, but what have we been talking about? Just when we think God's not, he is. Stay at it. Victory has already been won, right? That's what it said in verse 57. So let me encourage you tonight. No labor is in vain, Sunday school teachers. The time you spend studying and giving your lesson to your, your class, it's not in vain. Uh, children's church workers. Well, I just sing a few songs with the kids and, and give them a little lesson. It's not in vain. And it's not just a few songs with the kids and a little lesson. It's influencing lives and hearts. The nursery workers, aren't you thankful for them? It's not in vain. Teachers, singers, all the time you put into practicing and preparing your voice and your heart. You know what? It's not in vain. God's using it. Having gospel conversations with unbelievers throughout your week. It's not in vain. You say, well, I just don't feel like I got anywhere. Let God be the judge. He said it's not in vain. Greeters, it's not in vain. How about praying for each other? Never wasting time when you're praying. Never. 
You want to feel like you did something? Pray. You want to feel like you made a difference? Pray. Powerful. Serving one another. It's never in vain. None of it is useless. In fact, it's all useful. Don't believe, that you're, don't believe the lie that your service for the Lord isn't worth it. So Paul says, stay at it. Don't waffle. Don't be discouraged. He says, the outcome is already determined. All you do for Christ is valuable. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this encouragement from your word tonight. And Lord, um, we love to hear about our future, that we are going to put on incorruption, and that, Lord, we're going we're to live forever with you. And, Lord, I, I'm so excited about that. I'm so thankful for it. And, Lord, I pray that as we realize and understand these things and the grace and the blessings that you've given us, Lord, that because of all of that, because the victory that you won for us on the cross, that we will be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in our work for you because you alone are worthy and all that we do for you is worth it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.